All right, so we're going to be talking about something that we call taxonomy or classification. Hello, Negro. Um, so this is related to evolution because um, one of the things we think about when we're um, thinking about how different living things get classified is um, how they've evolved and what, when two things have a common ancestor, how long ago they have a common ancestor, etc. So we start thinking about this. What are some terms, is there a term you could think of that applies to both of those things on the screen? Yes. How about we're trying to put them in a category? Squirrels like go on to trees. Well, both of those things. So give me a word that we could use Family. to describe both of those things. <laughs> what? Okay, we're getting there. Uh, yes. They are both sentient organisms. Organisms. Yeah. They're living things, right? Living things. Oh, that's that's thing. Obviously, that's a super broad, very general category. Like but they are, that is correct. These are both living things. There's some other terms. We haven't really learned about them yet. We could say they're both eukaryotes, and we'll learn what that means today. Um, but we can then start to use some other terms and become more specific. What's a, more, what's a term I could use for this? How about more general than squirrel? Okay, how about, good. This is an animal. Right? Now that's a very general term, but it's correct. Can we get a little bit more specific about it? It's what? Who said it? It's a mammal. That's getting more specific. Can anyone go another step more specific? Less specific? Baby squirrel. Brown squirrel? Maybe. Family. Marsupial. It's not a rodent. rodent. Ah, I like that. Oh, good. It's a rodent. Yeah. What if well, we get I, more? I, I, I do. What if we get more specific? Squirrel. What if we get even more specific? Squirrel. Gray squirrel. Eastern gray squirrel. Good. So, what, what we're talking about here are different levels of classification. So. This is a mammal, it's an animal, it's a living organism, it's a rodent, it is a squirrel, it's an eastern gray squirrel. We're getting more and more specific. We're going to talk about those things. What about this one? Trees. It's a maple. It's a maple. It's okay, let's, okay, so if I say sugar maple tree, yes. yes. Is that specific or general? Specific. Very specific. That's the actual species of tree. How about a general term I could use? Plant. It is a plant, yes. It's a tree. A, pl a plant is the most general, maybe. Well, we could say it's living. We could say it's a plant. We could say it is um, a tree. We could say, what, what's something a little bit more specific? The orange. A maple tree. There's lots of types of maple yeah, trees. Let's just say maple tree. Or we could say a sugar maple tree, which is what this actual type of tree is. Uh, we have a maple tree. Back so this home. concept of having categories to, to name things is an important part about this science that we call taxonomy or classification. So classification means to group things, to come up with names for things. It's a system of doing that. Andrea, are you? Yes. Yes, I am. And I'm also getting ready to work. Oh, like, there's this. So, uh, classification is a way of doing And the science of it is called taxonomy. Taxonomy is the studying how we put things into groups. So, People just, humans, just do this kind of as our nature. We want to have categories for things. We want to put labels on things and group things together. So people have been doing this forever. 
some in terms of like the history of this, even in ancient Greece, 400 years um, BC, Aristotle, famous philosopher, was coming up with ways of trying to group things into categories. Aristotle's way is he put all living things into three groups. Things that lived on land, things that lived in water, things that lived in the air. That's one way of doing it. As time went on, that's Aristotle. As time went on, as the scientific revolution took place, John Ray, this person, came up with a little bit different category. He classified things based on their body structure, sort of what they looked like. And he came up with the idea of a species. No, that's Ray Charles. Yeah. So when we talk about a species, we have a specific scientific biological de um, definition that we use. Okay. A species is, and we talked about this a little previously, a group of individuals that can mate together and produce fertile offspring. <clears throat> we talked about it with dogs, right? Dogs are one species. They can all interbreed, and their offspring can then reproduce. A horse and a zebra are not the same species. Okay? They can't mate and produce fertile offspring. One person that we sort of think of as the father of taxonomy is this guy called um, Perilous Linnaeus. He lived in the 1700s. And he sometimes is called the father of taxonomy. He came up with this idea that we could give organisms a specific scientific name that's different than their um, what we call common name. So we saw that, sh that sugar maple. When we say that word, those words sugar maple, those are words in the English language, words that we give to that type of tree. But in Germany, there would be another name for that type of tree. And in um, French, there would be another term for that type of tree. But Linnaeus came up with this idea that let's give everything a specific name in a different language. Linnaeus decided that Latin would be the correct language to use. And so he started giving all organisms a unique name in Latin. Where do they speak Latin today? Uh, Greece. Oh, well, nowhere. Yeah, nowhere but anymore. It's they, it used to be spoken. Right? It's the language of ancient Rome. But it's not currently spoken in any country by people in their active everyday life. So it's kind of a language that's fixed. And it's not specific to one country. So it doesn't favor one part of the world or another. Okay? It's a language that all scientists can agree upon. <coughs> so when scientists are doing some research on that tree that we saw, they wouldn't refer to it probably as a sugar maple. They would refer to it by its scientific name. It's Latin binomial name, which is Acer saccharum. That's the scientific name for a sugar maple. A red maple is Acer rubrum. What? Acer rubrum for what? A red maple. A white pine tree is Pinus strobus. A balsam fir is Aves balsamifera. So all of these different trees have their own. I took a, I had to take a course in college all about trees, and we had to learn all their scientific names. That's why I know these things. Um, so Linnaeus got us started on this. So now a scientist that's researching in French Canada or in Germany or in Norway can all refer to Acer, Acer saccharum. And they know they're all talking about the same exact species. 
So in this system, everything has a two-part name, Acer Saccharum. Homo sapiens is the human scientific name. Um, Pan troglodytes is the name for a chip. What's the scientific name for a pig? I don't know a pig. Um, Sus. Canis lupus <laughs> is a the scientific name for a wolf. Um, so every species has a scientific name like this. And it's what scientists use when they're talking about these species. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this will make you guys laugh. But, uh, to, if I recall, the one for gorilla. Gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. Yeah, gorilla, gorilla, yep. Magilla, gorilla. Um, so, when we think about how we group things and how we categorize living things, we have this system. These different categories of classification. And when you, I was talking to you about the squirrel, you were giving me some of these. You were giving me the squirrel's class, which is mammal. Its order, which was rodent. Okay. I told you it was a gray squirrel, which was its species. You said it was an animal, which is correct. So we have these different levels of classification that go from very general to get more and more specific. So the largest group, the biggest, most general category of living things is called domain. Every single species in the world is in one of three domains. There's only three of them. We're in the same domain as a mushroom. Nice. And, uh, and um, an algae. So obviously that's a very general category. Then, as we move to be to more specific areas, we go from domain to kingdom, which you probably have heard about, maybe five kingdoms of living things. And then phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We're getting more specific as we go down. So, for example, when you think about humans, here's our classification. We are in the domain eukarya. We are in the animal kingdom. Our phylum is chordate. That's all of the things that are vertebrates, basically. Within vertebrates, we are mammals. That's our class. Within mammals, we are primates. That's our order. <coughs> Within that, we are hominidae is the family which humans belong to. The genus for humans is homo. The species is sapiens. And to get the scientific name of an organism, you put together the genus and the species. So humans are homo sapiens. Uh, sugar maple is Acer saccharum. A wolf is Canis lupus. So everything has a scientific name that's put together by its genus and its species. We have some rules that we'll talk about. The rules are that each Scientific name is usually the genus is capitalized, but the rest is lowercase. And we usually write it in italics if we're typing it because it's in another language, or if we're writing it by hand, we might underline it. Those are the rules of scientific names. Can you guess what these two things are? So I told you Acer Saccharum is a sugar maple, Acer rubrum, the red maple. What about these two things? Lions, Lions. tigers. No, nope. close, lions, Panthers. yes. Panthers. Felis domestica. All normal cats. A house cat, a pet cat is Felis domestica. As time went on, um, scientists started to classify things in different groups. Linnaeus only had two groups, plants and animals. But as we started to learn more about life, people came up with other ideas. In the 1860s, they added another kingdom because they started to understand microscopic life. In the 1950s, they added another group that included bacteria. In the 1960s, they added a fifth group. In the 1990s, a sixth group. So this 
idea about how we best classify things has changed over time. Today, we're with a six group classification system. So how do you determine which things go in which groups? We have uh, some basic criteria that we use. One thing we think about is how many cells the organism is made of. There's two options. Unicellular, which means what? One, one cell. And multicellular? One, more than one. Some living things are just a single tiny little cell. Those are called unicellular. Some things are made of many cells working together. They're multicellular. So that's one big category that we use to put things in these groups. Go ahead and write that down, single cells and many cells. Another factor that we think about is how complex the cells are, about their nucleus. And we're gonna be talking about cells soon, but where the genetic information is, is important. Some kind of cells, their genetic information is just all spread out throughout the cell. These are simple organisms. We call them prokaryotes. If it helps you remember, remember, pro rhymes with no, because they have no nuclear membrane. Their DNA is just scattered throughout their cell. The other organisms, the other category here, is a eukaryote. They do have a nucleus. Their DNA is inside of this membrane. Humans, for example, all animals are eukaryotes. They have a nucleus in their cell that has DNA. We categorize things also by how they get energy. How can living things get energy? There's two ways, really. Right? But how do they get... So, these two words come into play. Autotroph and heterotroph. I think autotroph is they make their own food, and heterotroph is you got to get your own food. What do you mean they make their own food? So, what's an example of something well, you like know, that? Like, Photosynthesis. Yeah, plants are autotrophs. They don't need to eat anything. They can take sunlight, go through the process of photosynthesis, and make molecules that they can actually use for energy. They're called autotrophs. And like Luke just explained, heterotrophs cannot do that. Are you heterotrophs or autotrophs? We're heterotrophs. You're heterotrophs. You have to drink Coca-Cola, drink chocolate milk, eat peaches or oranges or slices of pizza or Slim Jims in order to get energy for yourself. You have to eat other things. That's called heterotroph. You can't just go in the sunlight and through photosynthesis create your own food. That would be interesting. I can't if I try that. You get a good tan. So autotrophs produce food on its own through chemical processes. Heterotrophs have to consume or eat other things. We are all heterotrophs. All animals pretty much are heterotrophs. Then the last thing that we use to categorize things is the cell wall. Do they have this hard sort of shell around the outside of their cells called the cell wall, and what's it made out of? U.S. Cytoplasm? Well, we'll talk about that. That's what's in your next Cytoplasm is going to be part of our next section. Membrane? I can't remember. The cell membrane surrounds the cell, but that's different than the cell membrane. I mean, the cell wall. I'm trying to think of what's made of. Chitin or Something. cellulose. Cellulose. All right, so let's talk about some of the Major groups of living things. The one domain that includes bacteria. Um, so bacteria are single cells. They are unicellular. Bacteria are just single cells. 
And they're simple cells. They don't have a nucleus. We call them prokaryotes. Some bacteria are autotrophs and some are heterotrophs. Some can make their own food. Some have to eat other things. Bacteria also have a cell wall. Bacteria reproduce very quickly, and they reproduce asexually, which basically means they split in two. They just make a copy of themselves. That's how they can reproduce. They yeah, they multiply and they multiply quickly. Is it what? Like the atoms. Well, they're made of not more than bigger than atoms. They're squishy stuff. They're just cells, individual cells. But some bacteria can also reproduce sexually and exchange genetic material with another bacteria. So you are familiar with some of these. Streptococcus is a type of bacteria. Why might you be familiar with it? It's the bacteria that if it gets into your throat can cause an infection called, we call it strep throat. It's caused by this specific bacteria. Staphylococcus is another bacteria that can cause infection, especially skin infection. Right? You can get a staph infection, which is an infection of your skin, by this bacteria. E. coli is a type of bacteria that lives in our digestive tract. It lives in our intestine. It helps us actually. It helps us to break down certain types of food. It's also algae. This is Streptococcus. This is Staphylococcus. This is E. coli. This is blue green algae. These are all types of bacteria. Well, I think it's pretty cool. What's up? Pretty. I think it's beautiful. You guys hold on. Hold on. Angelina, what? No, the bacteria just evolved over time. Well, like to like cause an infection. Yeah. Yeah, like so. What would happen is like maybe you shared a drink with somebody that had a sore throat. So what happened is like a one of these um strep bacteria that might be on that bottle might get into your mouth. And then it starts to reproduce and form more bacteria, and that starts an infection. How do we cure? How do we treat infection? Antibiotics. Antibiotic. A medicine that specifically targets bacteria is called an antibiotic. We talked about that in our last video. They kill antibiotics kill bacteria. So if you have strep throat, you go to the doctor, they test you, they probably are going to give you this medicine called an antibiotic to help it improve. Okay. Another domain is one that's kind of, um, you probably don't know much about it. This is one that was only discovered in the last 20 or 30 years. It's called archaea. And it's actually somewhat similar to bacteria when we list the <coughs> criteria, but it's actually pretty different. Again, it's unicellular meaning it's one cell. They are prokaryotes, which means they don't have a nucleus. Some of them are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. They do have a cell wall, and it's actually different from the cell wall you would find in bacteria. That's why they're in their own group, one of the reasons. They can reproduce asexually. And the reason scientists only discovered them 30 or so years ago, because they live in places that scientists thought nothing could survive. In space. Like in extreme salt conditions, in extremely hot conditions, in geysers, in these sort of boiling waters filled with sulfur. Scientists thought nothing could survive these conditions, but actually when they looked a little bit closer and knew what to look for, they actually find some of these organisms living in these conditions. 
like in deep sea vents, yep, that's where you find methanogen. Or in extremely salty conditions that most life could never tolerate, you could find these halophiles. And then we get to the third domain that we belong in. These are called eukarya. These are the groups of organisms that are eukaryotes. They have a nuclear membrane. They have other organelles. And they, now they'll start to get things that are more familiar to you. For example, fungi, plants, animals, protists, all of these are in this domain we call eukarya. Protists are small, little, single-celled organisms. Okay, they're mostly unicellular. You may have looked at these one time, like um, in seventh grade. You may have looked at a paramecium or an amoeba or something like that. Did you do that? Yeah. Those are protists. They're eukaryotes, like we said. They have a nucleus, they have other organelles. And some of them are autotrophs, some of them are heterotrophs. This was a weird kingdom because scientists kind of put it as, well, if this organism doesn't fit anywhere else, we'll just toss it in the protist kingdom. Oh, shoot! Here are some examples of some of the protists. You don't have. We're not going to talk about all the details. It's all filled in for you. But these are some that you might look at. These animal-like protists. They move around. They include, this is an amoeba here. This is a paramecium. Okay. Okay, they swim through the water. You find them lots of times in fresh water. If you go to a pond and take a sample of water and look at it in a microscope, you could find protists living in it. There's also some that are more like plants. Okay. Things like spirogyro, which has a spiral living form, or kelp, which grows in these big kelp forests underwater. These are diatoms. They have a shell that's sort of really interesting. So, protist, there's a wide variety of types of living. Then we have fungi. I've been called this before. <laughs> But we do root on people and feed off their food, their life. I don't know. I don't know what they feed on. Um, so fungi, many fungi uh, are decomposers. What are what are fungi? Give me some examples. Well, they're a type of uh, you know paras They're a type of like they're kind of a parasite. You see, they they latch on to something and feed off it. Some are parasites, but a lot are not. They just they. Mushrooms, for example. Mushrooms Moss. are fungi. Moss. Moss is actually a plant. Oh, uh, how about uh, a, a rust? No. Uh, we'll talk about some. So, fungi, um, some of them are multicellular, they're like a mushroom. Some of them are unicellular, like yeast. Oh, yeast is a fungus? Yeast is a fungus. What are yeast used for? Um, bread. Bread. Muffins. Muffins. Um, fermentation, alcohol is made from yeast. Um, is yeast the same as wheat? What's that? Yeah, some types of um, fungi can be infectious. You could have fungal diseases. What's that? You ever eat a yeah. mushroom with stuff? Yeast can, infect, can cause infections. Um, good question. Um, so let's talk, we'll talk about that in one second, Angie. Um, so, eukaryote, there are eukaryotes, one guy. A mold. Oh my god. 
Um, they have a cell wall, and they can reproduce through something called budding or making spores. Now, if you've been watching on um, The Last of Us, you may have recognized some of this because are you guys anyone watching it? Yeah, some people on the middle. Last of us, no. Well, it involves fungus. I'll say that. It's like a, a zombie virus. It's like enslaved the human race. I'm pretty sure. I've never seen it. Yeah. So here we have a mushroom, obviously. You ever eaten one of those? Like, a mushroom? Oh, a mold. Mold, mold that grows on bread and makes food spoil is a type of fungus. Yeah. Mildew. Sorry, I took that this morning in my house and told it to me. Um, so mildew and mold is an example of a fungus. That can grow in your bathtub? Yeah. Ew, that's disgusting. Sorry. Sorry. This is yeast. Jordan? That's pretty tasty. Good. It's good. Hey, go. Gross on the my point of view. Um, usually like algae. That's a type of plant. Cancer. Yeah. Um, so this is yeast. Right. And Angie asked about yeast a little bit. So yeast, um, anyone ever, who's made bread or something with yeast in it? So what is it? Have you seen it? What does it look like? It looks, it's like, it looks like powdery grain. You open a packet, right? And it's got this like brownish powder. And you mix it, usually you mix it with water first, then you add it to flour. And you let it rise. Yeah, so what's, what's going on? Like if you just mix flour and water, it wouldn't rise. You need heat. But if you add this powder, which is our actual living organism yeast, rise. it does rise. You need that. That makes it grow taller. What do you think? What's happening there is this: these yeast are living. They're eating sugars that are in the flour and digesting them. And what they produce as a byproduct is carbon dioxide, a gas. And as they produce, as they eat the sugar and produce carbon dioxide, it forms little bubbles, which causes the dough to rise because the, in, these little bubbles of carbon dioxide are getting trapped. And so that's why things that when you add yeast to flour, they rise. Um, they're forming carbon dioxide bubbles. And when you then bake it and slice it like the little bubble, the little air pockets in the bread. Those were filled with carbon dioxide from these yeasts. Some yeast can take sugars and digest them and turn them into alcohol. And that's why yeast is used in brewing things like beer or wine. Okay? Because the same process happens and that one of the byproducts is alcohol. Um, fungus, other types of fungus can be used to make cheese. Or um, this summer I made sauerkraut which is caused by bacteria and fungus that ferments vegetables and things. So we do use fungus in lots of different ways. We eat mushrooms, obviously. Um, Who here knows what penicillin is? Yeah. What is penicillin? It's a drug. It's what we just named it. What type of drug is it? Mold. Mildew. It can, what does it kill? Bugs. Uh, the, 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 the stress bacteria. Oh. It's an antibiotic. Oh. But it was first discovered on a fungus. It's oh. produced by fungus. Blue cheese. Oh, that's a mold. The the bluish parts, the veins that are in blue cheese, they're called, they're created by a fungus. They inject a special type of fungus into um, a cheese, and it forms those those greenish blue veins and gives that cheese it's like flavor. Sometimes it'll be like chunks of it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it bad why it stinks sometimes? Yeah, strong cheeses because of that fermentation process can smell and yeah. If it's just in food, like can it be in other objects? Like just... those same bacteria? Yeah. Probably. They can probably contaminate milk. Oh um I saw cheese in it. Yogurt is made not by a fungus but by bacteria that are in the milk. Fermenting it through the same kind of process. Yeah, I mean, some fungus can have like complex life as like the last of us is based on this type of fungus called cordyceps. And it infects, cordyceps infects insects typically. 
are used to dubs. And what happens is this fungus gets into the insect's body, breaks down their actual body tissue. That's what it uses as their nutrition. But it also goes to their brain. And it con basically controls the insect's behavior, the fungus does. It causes the insect eventually, after most of it's been digested, to crawl up to a high place on a branch or something and freeze there. And then the cordyceps fungus produces fruit, which breaks out of the insect's head. And then it releases spores, which can infect other insects. Wow. And so it like basically makes these insects into zombies. And The Last of Us game, or TV show, is sort of about, well, what if that same thing happened, but it infected humans? Yeah. That's yeah. So that's what the I like show that science fiction type stuff. Mm. All right, a couple more groups. Plants. We know about plants. They're very familiar to us. Are they unicellular or multicellular? Think about a tree. Is it made of a single cell? Multi cell. Or many cells? Many cells. Many. They're multicellular. Do um, plants' cells have a nucleus in them? Do you remember from seventh grade? Probably. No. They do. Oh, they do? They do have a nucleus. They're eukaryotes. Are they autotrophs or heterotrophs? Autotrophs. Auto. They make their own food. They have chloroplasts. They go through photosynthesis. Oh, yeah. What chloroplasts? Chloroplasts are the <laughs> organelles. We're going to learn about that in our this week, that's where photosynthesis happens. Do, do plant cells have a cell wall? Remember that? Yes. No. Oh. They do. They have a cell wall around them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And plants can reproduce sexually or asexually. So plants can reproduce sexually. Sometimes people don't understand that. But pollen that comes out of trees often in the spring, that's actually the male sex cell like, of plants. That's so like if you're it's like sperm cells. So like if you're sniffing a flower and you got pollen on your nose, you got yes. sperm on your nose. Yeah, pretty much. Well, that's gross. <laughs> Is that like the part Ooh, that people are allergic to? Yes, too? and lots of people are so allergic funny. to pollen. <laughs> yep. So funny. Um, inside of flowers are actually Same. egg cells that in order for a plant to reproduce sexually, yeah. pollen, from a male flower has to get on the anthers of the female flower. And then they basically fertilize a little um, egg cell that's in the flower. And then it grows into a new plant. You can mix plants, you know. You can, you can take pollen from a plant and fertilize the female flowers using like a paintbrush. There's different types of plants. Some, like moss, don't grow tall because they have no tubes to bring water and nutrients around, so they grow very low. Others, like a tree, a maple tree, like we talked about, have these tubes that carry water, that carry sugars back and forth. They're called the xylem and phloem. Ferns, for example, flowers, trees, all of these are what we call vascular. And then our last group, animals. That's us. The animal kingdom. Are animals single cell no. or multicellular? Multicellular. Multi. We're made of trillions of cells working together. Animals are multicellular, right? Do animal cells have a nucleus in them? No. Yeah, they do. They're eukaryotes, right, Chelsea? Yeah. They have a nucleus, we call them eukaryotes. How about getting energy and food? We eat stuff, we eat other What's We're the term about? we're going to use? Herbivores? Not quite. Heterotrophs. Heterotrophs, good. Do animal cells have a cell wall around them? No. They do not.
Animal cell animals typically reproduce sexually. What's an asexual animal? Um, like some, like a star, C like a starfish, a sea sponge, can just sort of a piece can break off and yeah. grow into a new organism. Or a worm. That that is that. A little bit. Yeah. But most of the time, animals require sexual reproduction. They require mixing of genes from two different parents to produce the offspring. Here's the groups of animals. Well, I'll just tell you a little bit about them. You know, there's not really much for you to write down here, but it's kind of interesting. Luke just mentioned these. What is that? Well, that's a sea sponge. Those are sponges. Sea sponge. You sponge? actually um, might not think about it, but they're actually an animal. A sea sponge is an animal. An animal. Yeah. I thought it's coral is also an animal. A sponge is a type of animal. Hello, this is where's the sponge house? Well, where, where, yeah, where's his oh, pineapple geez. house? Oh, in his square oh, pants, in his pet sea oh, snail. Oh, um, Did you know that actually sea stars? So a sponge. Has anyone ever seen a sponge like this? Yeah. Like you could first. buy it at the um, like a fancy bath store, like in, in yes. using yeah. a shower and wash your body with. Like yeah, loofah they're sometimes that's called. A that's a real skeleton of a dead animal. Loofah is a plant. It's a plant. It is? Mm -hmm. You're sure? Mm -hmm. What do you call, is this called a loofah? No, it's just called a sponge. Oh, oh a loofah is a plant? Mm -hmm. oh, I always call that a loofah. It shows how much I know about fancy bats. But anyway, this kind of, this is a real skeleton of an animal that's dead. Uh, sponges are filter feeders. They basically suck water in from the sea and squirt it out and as it goes by they filter out little bits of plants and bacteria that's how they get their food no sometimes um richard coro does that which one yeah i guess i don't really can i see this picture oh no coro is actually uh, live yeah, that's something different no one ever knows that i thought that was called the loofah no. okay okay <laughs> Um, so that, that's actually an animal. It has all the characteristics we just mentioned related to animals. It's multicellular. It has to eat things to get food. It doesn't have a cell wall. It's eukaryote. Uh, Nidarians are cool. This includes things with tentacles. That's stingy. Sometimes. Um, some Nidarians can sting you. They have tentacles with stinging cells. Anyone ever got stung by a jellyfish? No. How bad did it hurt, Mr. Mister? Uh, let's just say I would not recommend it. Okay. <laughs> I never have. have. Your hand or whatever. Maybe. So know, yeah, it doesn't actually help. They have tentacles um, that float through. That's how they catch prey. What's this? Coral. Fish. Or anemone. That's coral. <laughs> and coral are a type of animal. They have a, a shell that forms these big coral reefs. And they have in them these little, if you look closely, things with tentacles that kind of come out of them. Um, they could release offspring that swim around. But pretty much once they um, attach, they are stay in one place. But they're animals. Yes. Like in Nemo hides inside of the anemones. Anemones are nadarians. Oh, I, that yeah. makes my sense. They're really cool to look at. It, a coral reef oh, has a huge diversity of like living things that live in and near it. Have you ever been to the Great Barrier Reef? I have not. Um, oh, here's some interesting stories about some of the worms. Worms are animals. These are flatworms. Do they live inside of you? Some of them can live inside a person or an animal. Angelina, what'd you say? Tapeworms. A tapeworm is an example of one of these. It's a, what do tapeworms? Can I say it, please? Hold on, hold on. Don't they like close up the stomach, like suffocate the stomach? In a so way, that's not how it works. they live in the stomach yeah. or the intestine. And what do they eat? Your, your stomach acid. No, not quite. The food, the yeah. food you eat, they eat. So as you, so if you have tapeworms inside your body, as you're eating your food, they're digesting some of it, taking the nutrients. Can you feel it in your body? Not you. They can't. I mean, if it's all small, no. Yes. But they can. All right, I got a couple stories about worms. Tapeworms. When I was um, 
we had our first dog I ever had. I never had a dog as a kid. Um, I was bringing her in the backyard to go to the bathroom, and then she went to the bathroom, and I looked down at the little pile she left, and on top of that was a tiny little white thing about the size of a grain of rice. Mm -hmm. And it was, so this is a tapeworm. And what happens is every once in a while, if they're inside of an animal, a piece breaks off and comes out when they go to the bathroom. So it wasn't that small? That it was small. Its body. Inside its body was a lot bigger. So there, this is how they can Ew. spread. Because if another neighborhood dog came around my backyard and was like sniffing around where my dog went to the bathroom, because that's what dogs do, and got ingested that little section, then that dog could be infected with the tapeworm. And that's how they could spread from animal to how, animal. How is it in humans? Well, you can eat rotten food or something. So some, so some of these are in foods that people eat. That's and right. if the food that you eat happens to be infected with a tapeworm and you don't cook it and don't kill that, then a person can eat like it. Imagine you're like also, up. some types of worms can get in through skin. Um, right. Or you could just sort of ingest them if you're swimming in waters that have um, parasitic worms in them. Yeah, that's yeah, that's why we have certain temperatures we cook our food for, not just for worms, but bacteria. Because if we cook food high enough temperature, you kill those bacteria. And so even if you ingest them, they're not gonna cause you to get sick. Like imagine you're on the toilet and you use the bathroom and then when you wake up, you just uh, you poop off like a, a twenty foot long worm. Well, all right, I'll tell you this story. So, um, if you ever, when you get a, a new puppy, I think maybe cats too, um, if you get it from like a breeder or something, uh, usually you get it like six, eight, ten weeks after it was born. And in the early stages of the puppy's life, it's actually given a medicine called a deworming, because often puppies almost always are infected with parasitic worms. So they give the dog this medicine and it kills the worms and they're healthy. When we got our um, little chihuahua mix, for some reason, I don't know why, we got her very young and she wasn't able to get the deworming yet. So we had to give it to her. So she's a tiny little puppy like this big and we had to give her the deworming medicine. Which I don't know, I didn't know anything about this one. Okay, we gave her a single pill, but then for like, two full days, anytime she went to the bathroom, it looked like, like a plate of spaghetti oh, gross. after she went to the bathroom. Because that's what this medicine's supposed to do. It kills the worms, and then they come out when the dog goes to the bathroom. But I did not expect like to have huge amounts of worms coming out from my little tiny puppy. Um, so it's a natural process. It happens. And there's medicines you know, that they give to animals. Here's another example. This is a different type of worm. If you have a dog, you might give your dog every three months a little, it looks like a treat. It's a medicine called heart guard. You ever heard of that? What is that? So that's, a, this is a, a round worm that is, um, infects the heart and circulatory system. It's called a heart worm. It can actually be deadly to a dog. It infects dogs. It's a parasite that can live in their circulatory system. It can make its way to their heart. And if it's reproducing and growing, it can actually clog up their heart so it doesn't work anymore. So lots of times you might give a dog this special medicine. It's just once every three months, and it prevents them from getting it. This, yeah, you can. Um, yeah, this is a round worm that infected human. It can. Oh, oh that's disgusting. And then there's the worms that we are more familiar with and maybe like better than these parasites. Mm -hmm. Earthworms, annelids, segmented worms. <laughs> they're very, they're super positive. They help add air to the soil. They break down organic matter and fertilize the soil. They, it's, yeah, they're fine. Did you ever see on the ground in the mud like little clusters of? Oh, shoot. Wait, that's warm. Well, you know, I always thought when I was a kid it was just mud, and I used to like pick it up, throw it at my sister and stuff, or squish it between your hands. Do you know what I'm talking about? These little clusters. Yeah, that's not just mud. It's actually earthworm feces. 
Yeah. I didn't know that when I was a kid. But it's, it's uh, interesting. Yeah, they have that has lots of nutrients and so forth that they that will go into the soil eventually. Here's another example oh, a of a worm. That's a leech. Wait, what? Leech is a type of it's related to an earthworm. And they attach to animals or fish and they digest the blood from it's like the same group, not like just like, like mammals, kind of. So it's like they're not the same organism, but they're related to each other. You know what they're kind of related to? I think lampreys. Ooh. Well, lampreys are fish. Mollusks. You're familiar with lots of these people use as food, right? Uh, clams, squid, octopus, oysters. All of those are mollusks. That's a subgroup of mollusks. And so snails, um, clams, slugs, all of those are in this group, mollusks. Like you, I, okay. but the mollusks are squishy and have... They're, they're usually squishy. They're soft, but some of them have a shell, a hard shell. That's actually skin. So, so here, here's some proof of that. So my dad was uh, logic in taxonomy squidward is biologically related to gary yeah i guess yeah i guess so some, some some theory. Theory. yeah yeah we could we should talk about which had common ancestor um most recently you know starfish actually eats sea sponges mm -hmm. here's another phylum arthropods we're familiar with these include things like insects arachnids Crustaceans, centipedes, millipedes, these are all arthropods. They have a hard shell. You do? So these are arthropods. These are echinoderms. They have spines usually. Um, starfish, sand dollars, sea urchins. Yeah, they move. So now they're like little, uh, those robotic vacuums, they sort of move around. Got like little legs on them. Yeah. And this is when they're alive, they, they are like often purplish in color. Sometimes you can see them in like a shell store and they're just all white and bleached out. But that's that's just the skeleton that remains. So like when it goes to the feet, so like when has it turn white? It's dead. It basically after it dies, like this purple section is like kind of almost its skin in a way. And it just like decomposes. And then you're left with, it's like bones. Like, a, you know, if a squirrel dies, you would eventually be left with bones. That it, This would be the same kind of thing for the sand dollar. Okay. Chordates, the last group. These are things that have basically um, a backbone and a spinal cord. Think about a backbone right here called uh, cephalopod. <laughs> Fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals are the big groups. Vertebrates, yep. Fish, frogs, amphibians, amphibians, reptiles, avians, birds, and mammals. Those are all animals. What's that? Um, mammals. Mammal. Sure. So there's our general overview of all of life on Earth and its classification. Any questions? Let them, this is not stuff that you're going to have to memorize all of this, but I just want to talk about it because it's interesting and helpful to understand how things are sort of organized.